Welcome, Tanya. It's great to have you here with us to talk Femtech hardware. Femtech, of course, being technology products that are specifically designed to address women's needs. Um, a bit unusual, perhaps, in this audience, but we'll see. So uh, your first product is really a very different kind of wearable. Why don't you tell us exactly what this device is? Yeah, so LV is, we're all about creating extraordinary products that improve women's lives. So as Natasha said, we're in the connect devices space, so hardware and software. The first product is a pelvic floor exercise trainer, which before we created it didn't even exist as a category, but is actually a really important part of women's health and wellness. So I don't know if many of you, maybe I'll do a very quick anatomy 101. Absolutely. If you think of the core That's body as a drum, the top is your diaphragm, the bottom is your pelvic floor. It's a muscle that all women need to look after, but most women don't think about it until they have a baby. And it's, it's symptomatic of most issues in women's health, that because we don't talk about it, you have a lot of preventable health problems, and there's not been much technological innovation. So many people might think it's a niche issue, but actually it's a huge issue for women. So the adult sanitary pad market is 14 billion a year. Mm. Um, women have a, a variety of health problems, and this is really what we wanted to tackle with the first products. And I mean, Kegel exercises themselves weren't new. So I'm kind of curious what made you think that connectivity was kind of the missing link here to, to really bring this, yeah. this product alive in a new way for yeah. a new generation, yeah. I suppose. I mean, I think, look, if we're all honest, the thing about wearable tech is there were big expectations, and I think a lot of the wearable tech companies haven't met those expectations. I think when you look at it, a lot of the hardware, there is a sort of an arm sensor race to put in as many sensors as possible. So consumers are being given data that's not meaningful. With LV Trainer, what we did was kind of the opposite. I mean, just in terms of background, I have a PhD in women's health. I was head of research and innovation at Mary Stokes, which is the largest global provider of women's health services. So everything we did in developing our products was evidence-based. So when I looked at the market, and I think this is a big space in and of itself, mm. is that there's a huge medical device arena where you've got really ugly utilitarian medical device products, and they're not very consumer friendly. And actually what we saw in the pelvic health uh, market was that women were using a lot of tech that wasn't shown to work. And the only thing shown to work was this horrific contraption <laughs> where you had this you know, vaginal probe and electrodes and you're linked up to a, a monitor. And as you exercise, you could see how you were doing. Right. And that's been shown to be the most effective approach. So for us, it was about taking that evidence-based technology and turning it into something women could use. So the whole wearable and connected aspect was really important to the design. But I'm kind of curious as well. Do you see your, de your kind of product as a medical or a lifestyle device, or kind of both, I suppose, yeah. in a way? I think that's one of the big things we're trying to change when you think about women's technology, is that it's always been seen as health products and health technology, which means it's a medical device, it's regulated as such. But a lot of this is, these issues, be it dealing with menstruation, pregnancy, postnatal, menopause, are just natural parts of being women. So for us, it's definitely about lifestyle. It's just about womanhood. So it's about taking that medical device, the medical technology, but turning it into a lifestyle product. And uh, are there ever any challenges around sort of hitting those two notes? Because obviously, medical devices, we assume, are extremely rigorously tested over a very long period, whereas you know, a consumer wearable, maybe these are pushed out into the market very, very fast. Yeah. Is there ever any tension? Do you feel the tension between those, trying to hit those two, two notes with this, this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we're sort of right in the middle of a huge digital and health technology revolution. And so the regulatory framework is sort of still catching up with that. So we're seeing it even if it's just an app, yeah. or be it if there's a hardware component but we know that consumers are increasingly taking health into their own hands, they're living healthier lifestyles, so we need to adapt to that. I do think, I mean, we're so far, we're kind of, you know, I think the FDA and actually quite a lot of, even here in Europe, are beginning to sort of be a bit more flexible. So, so far, it's kind of riding that wave a bit. Right. So you launched the, I think it's now called the LV Trainer, over mm -hmm. two years ago, around two mm -hmm. years ago, um, and you sell the device and you make, uh, it's a one-off kind of, payment, I think, yep. and you make a margin, presumably, on the hardware. Is the company profitable yet? Yeah, so, actually, I didn't really explain. So, yeah, so this is, so for those of this you is, guys, this, is the, uh, so this is actually the LV trainer. So <laughs> it's terribly cute. It is. It's a bit like an exercise <laughs> trainer, but you actually insert it inside your body, and then it talks to your app, and then as you exercise and as you squeeze your pelvic floor, you can see on your app how you're doing. So as I was saying, this was based on what was sort of existent in hospital medical technology, but turning it into more fun consumer product. Yeah. And I'll be honest, look, I was out pitching a product where it's an intimate product, it's 
hardware and nobody wants to invest in hardware anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's a non-existent category. So um, I do think, you know, we had to really, there were a lot of naysayers out there, people who were like femtech, women's tech, this is niche. Is this a real issue for women? Um, you know, it's not going to work. And so I think we, yeah, we absolutely had to, to nail it in terms of your question on the unit economics, on getting to profitability actually within six months, on signing big retailers, on getting a lot of celebrity endorsements. You know, we kind of really had to prove that there was traction with this product. So it's like Femtech, you have to, you have to work harder really to, because to, the expectations are so geared towards male products, perhaps male founders even, you, the standard is you have to reach is just higher, right? You have to overperform effectively. Yes, because you're having to, yeah. you know, I mean, the, the data's there in terms of that there's a real need for this, but if it's a new category, then, yeah. then you do need to prove yourself, I think, a little bit more. I mean, I was, I didn't mention, but my co-founder is Alex Asaley, who started Jawbone. So obviously Jawbone has been through so many different uh, <laughs> iterations and changes and we you know a lot of learning from there and I think his main message to me was Tanya get the unit economics right make sure you have the gross margin so you can go retail you know I think in hardware we fool ourselves that we can just sell direct and that's going to do it but ultimately mm. it's still a, a consumer electronics business I was going to ask if he's given you the post-mortem on Jawbone obviously <laughs> lots of lots of things happen with that company how has what he experienced sort of fed into the decisions you've made at LV yeah, I mean, he's been in a, so we're a great co-founding team because my background is in women's health. Uh, I understand the issues and he brings the experience from Jawbone. So right from the beginning, he was the one who sort of pushed me to make sure, you know, I did the typical startup thing at the beginning. I hired junior engineers who didn't know what they were doing, but he knew how complicated connected devices were. So we made sure we hired the best engineers from Dyson, go for the tier one manufacturers, because I think a lot of hardware startups don't realize how many pitfalls there are on the manufacturing side. Yeah. But I think what Jawbone did so wonderfully was create a brand around you know, products that consumers love and engage with. And that's yeah. very much what we wanted to do with LV Train and that we've managed to do so that you know, women aren't talking about yucky health problems, they're talking about it as something cool that, that they like to share with their friends. And did he have any definitely don't do this kind of <laughs> moments of advice? Off the record or on the record? <laughs> well. um, <laughs> Definitely, you know, don't raise too much money. I mean, obviously, hardware, you need a lot of uh, it's capital intensive. Right. You need big injections of cash. But mm. uh, that was definitely, I think, one of his, his lessons from Jawbone. Mm. Hmm. That's good. Um, can, you, can you kind of give us an idea of sales so far for the, for the trainer? Yeah, so um, as I said at the beginning, it was tough, right? And actually, out of all the different, you know, I very much reached out to the consumer community. But I say of all the communities, the, the tech one at the beginning was a bit slow to kind of uh, to catch on, although mm. now I feel like it, you know, something it just all sort of starts happening in a wave. So at the beginning, uh, on the retail side, you know, we were having to bang down doors, explain to John Lewis and Selfridges or Fnac and Gary Lafayette in France why yeah. they should sell such an intimate product. Um, but then it really started just taking off. So we managed to, yeah, a million dollars just on direct sales, literally in the first sort of six months. And now that we've gone retail, well, this year we're on track for kind of 50% quarter and quarter growth. So it's, it's, it's really beginning to take off, but it uh, had to bang down some doors at the beginning. You had to do the work, yeah. Do you then feel that there really, really is a really huge business opportunity in femtech that was just neglected for a long time? Or was it that in some way that women weren't, there wasn't really an appetite at that point yeah. for these types of products? No, I think the appetite's there. I just think when you're creating a new category, there's naturally, well, it doesn't have to be femtech, any new category, there's a level of market education that needs to take place. So yeah. you need patient investment and it's going to take a bit of time. But then obviously it's much more exciting because you're doing something really novel. So our first product, the LV Trainer, is, is a new category. We're having to educate people about why it's an important part of the health. Our second product that we're bringing out in about six months is an existing product category. And I think particularly in femtech, there are a lot of women's health or wellness devices that just need a complete redesign and rethink. Yeah. So in those cases, obviously, it's, it's, it's an easier win. I mean, I think after having launched and made a success of a really sensitive, delicate product, I think the next one will be quite straightforward. <laughs> it will be a home run. I'm curious as well, again, because this was a very new category, new product. What, what do women sort of tell you when they come across this? And, and, and what were they looking for? Were they looking for a medical device and then they found yeah. a consumer device? Or? I mean, I think that's, again, going to the whole issue of wearable tech and why it's sort of gone slightly out of favor. I think, uh, as I was thinking about earlier, when, you know, consumers, if they're buying a product, maybe it's a bit faddish. They're learning about how many steps they've taken, but they're not really getting anything meaningful from that product. 
With LV Trainer, it's quite different. The people who buy it are paying for an outcome. Mm. So they either, want, you know, either they have a health problem that they want to treat or they want to prevent from a wellness perspective. So, and, and what that means is it's quite binary, but the consumers who use our products, you know, they kind of become quite evangelical about it. So when we send out surveys, over 80% of women see a result within as little as four weeks. Wow. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your background as well, because you mentioned you, you were doing research on women's health for Mary Stopes International, and you weren't working in the tech industry at all. So, I mean, what inspired you to make this great leap? <laughs> Well, so yes, yeah, so in my background, I have a PhD in HIV prevention. Uh, I went, to, when I was 18, my dream job was to be CEO of Oxfam or work in the UN. I went to work in the UN, had the dream job, um, you know, wrote, wrote a couple of books about women's health, saw myself as a real expert in, in these issues. But it was actually when I was pregnant that I realized, forget HIV or sexual health issues, it's actually just normal parts of being a woman, be it mm. pregnancy or postnatal or menopause, mm. that are completely overlooked. So it just really grabbed me as a, as a big issue for women that, that uh, where we need to innovate. And I'm always about impact. And in this case, I think technology has really lagged behind when it comes to women's issues. And I also think what's very exciting is the ability of technology to change conversation. Mm. So with LV, we have been, we are creating this whole new conversation around, let's be proud to be women, let's talk about our bodies, and this technology helps you feel in touch with your body. So for me, that, that's kind of the bigger mission that, that, that kind of gets me out of bed in the morning. But it's kind of interesting. Do you have a theory on why the technology industry really didn't kind of um, clock that this, there was this huge opportunity? I mean, there are very I mean, yeah, I mean, look, sides so to this, perhaps. But. We created this product. And I think because Alex, being the co-founder of uh, Jawbone, was bringing in lots of ideas like, hey, wouldn't it be cool Like when you take it out? It's fully waterproof. It charges in the case. There's no buttons. It turns itself on. You know, technological advances, which four years ago were actually quite which weren't mainstream at all. Mm. And what surprised me was engineers and uh, people were a bit like, hmm. I don't know, it's a bit high tech, maybe women aren't going to get it. And I think there is an assumption that women aren't early and avid um, adopters of technology, which obviously I believe that women, if you give them a great design, a great UI, they'll appreciate it. But yeah, if you look at the sort of typical, even in connected devices, when it becomes a woman's product, mm. often it might be you take an exercise tracker, you turn it into a bracelet or a ring, so a piece of jewelry, or you change the color. So the change is often on this sort of very aesthetic level. Mm. And I think that the big opportunity, which I think is very exciting, is recognizing that the female consumer is different from the male consumer. They do want products that look beautiful and are elegant, but they want the serious tech in it too. So I think that's the big space. And um, what about on the investor side? Mm. Um, I mean, You've raised, you raised quite a lot of money. Obviously, it's a harbor business. You need to raise money to get, to get that off the ground. Uh, when you went into VC's office pitching a, a smart you know, pelvic yeah. floor exerciser, what was that like? I, yeah. mean, I know you do have a VC firm that is actually an all yeah. women's firm, but obviously many VC firms still are male dominated. Yeah. Did, did they ever ask for a demo? Or <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, we raised about 10 million euros. Um, and for us, as I said, you know, the, the size of the proposition, it's quite, I think, to pitch the, the market for femtech is increasingly easy. I think any investor who doesn't see that the female consumer is a powerful uh, person in the room is, is well, mm. they're, da you know, they're, they're lost in, in my view. Um, in terms of pitching, but you, you know, you're right, as a female entrepreneur, the numbers aren't there yet. Only 7% of partners at VCs are women, yeah. and less than 5% of um, co-founders who are VC funded are, are women. So the numbers aren't there. But I think, um, you know, ultimately, as a female entrepreneur going in the room, you have to just sort of, maybe you're seen as a bit of an outsider because you're a woman, but maybe, you know, there's a lot of homophilia that's happening anyway, be it if they're judging you in your age, what university you went to, the way you sound, um, the color of your skin, all the rest of it. So I think as an entrepreneur going into pitch, you maybe have to just set the bar a little bit higher than you would normally mm. and confront any sort of assumptions you have. But, but yeah, for us in particular, I'd say um, it's a very binary issue. You know, if an investor is not interested in talking about intimate technology, we, we tend not to get a meeting, so. <laughs> um, do you think it's kind of helpful that we have this label now of femtech? Is that a, a useful thing? Yeah, I think it's useful to know, you know, to recognize that there is a huge opportunity in the tech space for products that are more geared towards women. And here, you know, because I think we sometimes in such a PC world, we forget men and women are different. 
nearly everyone will go through periods of menopause, most women will go through pregnancy and, and post-birth. So I think by, by creating this label, it helps us kind of identify that opportunity. Mm. And, and do you feel there's a supportive community of femtech founders now, or is it more kind of competition than community at this still quite early stage? I think right now we're at a very special moment in time, right? There's a huge feminist wave that's happening. There's a huge technological revolution and the health. So all of this creates a sort of a great opportunity right now. And, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I think, a lot of girl power. A lot of female founders are supporting uh, each other, and particularly those of us who are a bit more experienced helping the younger ones. You know, I think that's a very important part of... Yeah. building the ecosystem. I mean, startup communities can be very um, tight and founders share a lot of information yeah. with each other. I just wonder whether that has really, if there's been a time for that to mature in femtech. Yeah, it will perhaps come when there's more companies, but it's a, when there's relatively few, perhaps it's harder to have that really tight knit sharing kind of community that, that a lot of yeah. traditional startups seem no, to I, I mean, benefit I, from. It's happening really fast. I think I started four years ago. Femtech wasn't really even something that people talked about. Now it's kind of, there's increasing excitement. A lot of more women are wanting to get into startups. So mm. I think the change is happening fast. Um, so I, what's the end game for you? Do, you? do you see yourself kind of, are you hoping to sort of sell to a big medical devices company? Or are you kind of in this for the five, 10 years, long yeah. term, down the road, build the business to keep? Yeah. Um, it's funny, so a lot of investors sometimes say to us, oh, isn't this a bit niche, or you're coming in a very specific moment in a woman's life. For us, it's the post-birth period. Um, shouldn't you be trying to play against, you know, compete against the big players like Fitbit? But I think, actually, if you're coming in as a hardware startup, it is the most important thing you can do is win over a very specific consumer segment and then grow with them. So for us, it's about uh, all about new mum's wellness, recognizing that even if you have a baby, you're still a woman, you want to look after yourself. So winning over that consumer market and then kind of obviously taking them on a journey. So the vision is to have multiple connected devices that can support women at all stages of life. In answer to your question, you know, it's a, the, the, you know if we really want to do that, that's going to be a, it's a long-term game. It's a five-year or so horizon. And you could, do you feel you could be that one company that really dominates this, this space with a suite of different devices? For all, hitting all sorts of needs. Who, who else could it be? <laughs> I mean, Dyson is uh, obviously increasingly trying to hit. You're going to be the Dyson of Femtech. <laughs> we want to be bigger than Dyson. Amazing. <laughs> um, do these companies, these Femtech companies, do they need to be female-led? Mm -hmm. They don't need to be. I mean, I think there's a lot of evidence of you know, great brands and companies and tech companies that, that target women uh, that are not female-led. I think if you're looking at very specific issues that only target women, men might be a bit slower to, to come up with exactly what the right innovation is. But I think the, the second, the more important point, I think also is that, like with LV Trainer, right, it's a new category, it's changing the conversation, getting women to talk about their bodies differently. I think if you're out there changing the conversation, then it's a woman to woman type conversation. Mm, for sure. Um, perhaps. We're running short on time, but it'd be good. So what kind of one piece of advice would you have for anyone out there who's sort of looking at this space, thinking this is, there's an opportunity here? I mean, maybe women or men. Uh, what yeah. have you learned in your four-year four journey? Well, no, no, there is still an opportunity. And just to ignore the naysayers, I mean, even right now, like I would say, our product is women, medical, and on the, you know, the connected device. And each of those, at the moment, there's a lot of a lot of naysayers, so you have to just go out and prove them all wrong. You know, hardware, connected devices is still a very exciting space. I think we just need to come up with what wearables 2.0 is. In terms of the women and the proposition, it's, it's blindingly obvious that there's just a lot of tech needs across a woman's lifetime that, that still haven't been met. Um, nobody's, you know, a lot of people are beginning to look at menstruation, mm. fertility, obviously there's interest there. Nobody's looking really at menopause um, or, or other areas of hormonal and nutritional change. So I say there's definitely, we need more startups looking at women's issues. Lots of work to do. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, it's been really great talking to you and it'll be really exciting to see how this category evolves. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Natasha.